Maybe I should pray and kind of get this back into line here. Huh? Is, it Is it possible? I don't know. We'll find out. Lord God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we do have interaction. And that, Lord, we do have relationships. I th- give you praise, Lord. Lord, I need your help this morning to do what, I, what I've been given. And, Lord, I just thank you. You are just a mighty and an awesome God. We just give you praise. So, Lord, help me this morning. I'm looking forward to this, Lord, and I thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Being known. I'm not even sure we're on the same series we started with. (laughs) It kind of mutated somewhere in the middle of this, okay? But today we're talking more about making known. And we say, huh? Yeah, it'll make sense as we go. Okay. (laughs) But we have been talking about being known, how that we gain much personal use out of our pain, out of our past. We use our past to prove our validity on who we are. We have a need to be known. We want somebody to know us. Or we try to hide to protect ourselves, one or the other. But I think it's kind of fascinating. We don't have a need to know somebody. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Just think about that. We do have a need to be known, but we do not have a need to know. So those things, because they are incompatible, it means the whole system doesn't work. Okay? We rewrite every memory we access. So as we go through... Um, in the... What year was that? 2000. Um, I had an opportunity to... A uh, wild opportunity. Um, the pastor of the church in Greeley that we were under had been given an invitation to go speak at the graduation of a, the first graduation of the Bible school in um, Democratic Republic of the Congo. And they wanted somebody from the Victory Churches to come represent them and give out the certifications and the the different things. And um, he didn't want to go. And he took the invitation, he kind of just threw it on the desk and he just says, I don't want to go. I said, well, I do. He says, you want to go to this? <laughs> yeah. Man, it was just like, it just drove me crazy. And I thought this would be an awesome chance. And so I started talking to the different people around me and trying to see who was supposed to go with me because I don't go anywhere without a disciple. And uh, I called up my, my friend Randall, and I said, Randall, this is one of those fun conversations because it started off with, do not say yes. Do not say no. Don't say anything right now. Just pray. And here's what I want you to pray. These exact words. I don't want you to embellish it. Just go before Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, am I supposed to go to Africa with Lee? I'll call you back. Click. This has always driven him crazy because I've started that conversation like that several times since then. He'll, hello, don't say yes. Oh, no, don't say no. Oh, man, we (laughs) We went to um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and had a most amazing time of two weeks. We were there. It was a two-week trip. Unbelievable. Well, I'd done a journal and I wrote down what had happened. And I found it. Okay? In this thing they call a desk down on my head. And anyway, I found it inside all that. So I've been reading it. Was I there? <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm reading all this stuff. The way it happened, the way I wrote it down, is not the way I remember it. I'm looking at it going, oh yeah, this is the way it worked. I've told stories about that and I was not totally accurate. I think that's hilarious. Because why? Because we rewrite our memories every time we access them. And sometimes we access them, we rewrite them wrong. And we go back and our memories are not even the memories that was actually what happened. And I went, oh, wow, yeah, I forgot about this. And oh, then this and oh, yeah. And it's just, wow, this was fun. I haven't finished it yet. This has got me all excited. We make our pain worse, and we make our offenses deeper. And we try to make ourselves shine in our memories as why we did the things we do. We justified things. And we just pay. The more I talk about this, the more I, I get it. 
And I look at people and they be talking about it and they go, yeah, that's true. <laughs> we do that. So it gets a little complicated, doesn't it? Us dealing with our past. Well, of course it does. But we are already known. And this is one of the biggest things. Who knows what we've been through? Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible answer, the Sunday school answer is the right answer at this one. Jesus. He already knows us. Why do we get the idea that we can fake him out? That has always amazed me. That we, we try to, you know, <laughs> well, Lord? <laughs> or we try to blame him, and he's going, really? <laughs> One of the silliest things I, I, I have yet to have anybody explain to me how you can say to the Lord God of the universe the God of all creation, the God of everything who has redeemed you, spent his son's blood for you, and we can still tell him no. Anybody want to explain that to me? Yeah. Okay. Last week, we jumped into Romans chapter 5. Whew. Romans. And not only so, chapter 5, verses 3 and 5, it's 3 through 5, it says, and not only so, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction works out patience, and patience works out proven character, and proven character works out hope. And the hope does not put us to shame, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. Still an amazing, every time I teach it, I know that we haven't touched it, we haven't gotten across what it says. It still is amazing to me to boast in the effect of what affliction does to me. What have you been through? Well, what's it do for you? Well, you, you can respond wrong, and it can affect you adversely. Or you can respond right and learn massive things. And oh, it's, it's amazing. But does that mean that God is, has decided to not put you through any affliction because you're responding wrong? Anybody believe that one? He's still waiting. It's there to do something in and through me. The affliction is there to do something in me, through me, about me. There's a reason I'm going through the things I go through. And it says it works out provenness. Proven character is only one word. It means provenness. To know that you can go through it, and at the end of it, you're, you're shining. Okay? I like the idea of going through things. Um, I know when I've worked out in the cutting wood, doing different things, the smell of the cutting of the wood lingers on me. Okay? I like that. I could, you just, that sm cut, fresh cut wood smell. <laughs> I like that. I like that very much. And it just, it's, it's neat. How does my wife know when I've been out cutting wood? She can smell it on me, okay? Now, how does she know when I'm doing other kinds of work? She can smell that too, but it's not exactly the same thing. But to go through the afflictions, you actually go through it and you end up with the smell of smoke on you. Okay? Now, this is true in all cases except for um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, commonly known as as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? When they came out of the furnace, they didn't even smell like smoke. And yet all their bonds were burned off of them, and the people who threw them in died, okay? And they came out, and they didn't smell like smoke. That was a big deal. But I like the idea that when people go through affliction, they have in them a tempering of their personality. And you can sit there, and you can, you can sense, you can smell the smoke of what they have been through. It's, to me, it's, it's provenness. We have a future that is part of a plan. What's the word for a plan? Makashaba. <laughs> Makashaba. <laughs> <laughs> Affliction is a major part of life. I'm not going about to, to tell you that there is no going to be no affliction. I'm having a major discussion lately with Greg on different things we've been talking about end times and eschatology and all these sorts of things and the things people are afraid of and they have come up with theologies that make it so that they're not going to go through any affliction and that kind of amazes me because I go uh I, boy 
Where do you get that? It's not in the Word. God is not trying to keep you out of affliction. <laughs> he is not trying to keep you out of it. Okay? But we need to brag about what it does for us. What has it done for us? Okay? It's kind of an amazing deal. Very, very strong. We've gotten to James chapter 1. My brothers, count it all joy. Yay! When you fall into various trials, knowing that the proving of your faith works patience. But let patience have its perfective work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Joy because of what it produces in us. It's its work is to mature you. That's the, it's perfective work. It's work that's to grow you up. Mature and complete. So that you're complete. Not lacking in anything. Lacking nothing in your identity in Christ. John 16, 33. <laughs> I have spoken these things to you that you may have peace in me. Wow. You have distress in the world. Be encouraged. I've overcome the world. In this world you have distress. What's the Greek word? Come on, somebody. Philipsis. Philipsis. Oh, Jim wins the day. Jim gets a star on the day. You can't forget that word. No. <laughs> In, you have distress. You have philipsis. You have pressure. You have things that are going to happen to you in this world. But take heart. Be actually encouraged. And the Greek word for that, have courage. To actually get courage to go through. Be encouraged. May this produce in you courage. Should we have courage? Because I've overcome the world. Why are you freaking out? I've overcome the world. Yay. This is awesome. There will always be affliction or tribulation. Always. always. The only place for victory, though, is in him. What is he trying to show you through affliction? That you can't do it. <laughs> He's trying his hardest to show you that you in your flesh are not functional. You are not enough. You cannot do it. So therefore, what do you have to do? Oh, you mean trust God? Now, there's a concept whose time has come. <laughs> Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength and turns his heart away from Jehovah. <laughs> Blessed is the man who trusts in Jehovah, and Jehovah is his refuge. Jesus overcame, and so must we, because you're not an overcomer until you've overcome. You got to overcome something to become an overcomer. Oh, I love these sentences. These are fun sentences. These are good sentences. <laughs> what have you overcome? Well, if you haven't overcome anything, look at the letters to the churches in Revelation chapter 3 and 4. Uh, 2 and 3. Yeah, 2 and 3. And what does it say? At the end of every one of the letters, it says, To the overcomer I will. All the promises to the letters of the churches are only to overcomers. That's right. Okay. We can revel in the experiences that we have had because of the changes that he is making in us. We can revel in the fact of what we've been through. What have you been through? It's amazing if you will just listen to what Jesus is doing in you. He puts you through some really rough stuff. Instead of complaining about it, find out that what did he do he changed you to become more powerful now i can take anybody in this room i don't care who you are anybody in this room i take you right over to my workout room right over in the redemption building and i bet i can i don't care who you are i bet there's some muscle i can make sore in you somehow <laughs> some of you it's not going to be hard nathaniel went up to jared and tiff's nathaniel and kate went up there and spent time with them well they got this Caleb and Abby animals <laughs> up there. And they played, didn't they play? <laughs> An eight-year-old and a six-year-old beat this man up. They did all the moving video game stuff. And uh, why do we get sore? Because we're stressing muscles and we're releasing uh, lactic acid and all sorts of building all this stuff in our muscles it takes stress to build strength it takes stress to build strength and how do you want to build strength you actually get something that's heavy and try to lift it okay and the more times you lift it and the more you do 
then the stronger you'll become. It's, it's simple. We've seen this process in so many ways. How do you get strong? You stress your muscles. How do you get strong in your soul? You get stressed in your soul and how you respond correctly to it. Now, I have seen too many people on job sites lifting incorrectly and they'll go to do something and all of a sudden they go, eh, and they pull a muscle and they damage themselves. That's stress that they didn't respond to correctly. They didn't do it right. Okay, are we relating to this? We've gone through things in our life and it's hurt us. Why? Because we didn't respond to it correctly. We didn't see it. But when you start responding to it correctly, what does it do? Those stressors make you strong. They don't make you crazy. That's when you respond to it correctly. It doesn't make you nutso. Okay? Don't languish in the problems. Languish. That's a good word. You like that word. See, my little wordsmith friend here. We like these words. <laughs> Languish to be in it and just blah, let it rot you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the problem is we've, let, we've gone through these experiences and we let them cause a rottenness in our soul. We've let them hurt us. Don't languish in the pain. Respond to it. See what is making you become. See what God is doing to bring you up. Okay, it should bring about joy. Now, I have several of you, I do know major parts of your lifestyle, major parts of what you've talked about. I've, I've heard things of your past and things you've gone through. Was it fun? Oh, no, I didn't say it was fun. Was it even godly? No, no. But what was it? It was something for you to respond to, and as you are growing in Him, you can look back and see how it's made you strong in many different areas. Okay? That's just a good idea. It should bring about joy. God is developing His character in you. What's a good thing? For you not to be attached to this world. Attached to this world. What's He trying to do? He's trying His hardest to get you away from the things that are killing you. It has been hard in my office to explain to people what conviction is. People think conviction is bad. No, conviction is awesome. Conviction is wonderful. People say, oh, that's what's bad. No, it's an area where God is saying, this thing in your life is killing you, and I love you too much to let that continue. So I'm going to convict you about that and say, get rid of this. It's killing you. And you say, well, why doesn't God just take it away? No, because he gave you free will. You let it into your life. Now you're the one that has to get rid of it. Simple. This is very simple. This is 101. He convicts you to get rid of it. <coughs> simple. It's simple. We've got to know that that's what God is doing. He's trying to help us. To be a witness of his goodness through it all. That's the idea. That's the whole idea. To become who you really are. You can rest in that. Oh, no, this is really good because you can have rest for your souls. We've gone over that the week before. And how what we're doing things his path, what happens when we do his way? His way brings rest to our souls. Wow, what a concept. I can sit in the situation and go, well, thank you, Lord. How do you want to respond to this? And have peace even when everybody around is having turmoil. It's okay to be the only person in the room that has peace. It's okay. Everybody else is running around and, and you're the, hey, calm. It's okay to have peace. So few of us experience peace like that that we don't know what that looks like. We should, because the Prince of Peace is the one that's telling us about all this. Okay. That was review. We jumpeth. (laughs) Offeth the cliffeth. Here we goeth. (sighs) We all have a story to tell. Boy, do we. We have been through a lot. Oh, man, have we been through it. We've been through stuff. Why have you gone through it? So that God can get the glory. What? Our pain seems to be important to us. It really does. We want others to acknowledge how we have suffered. We want others to acknowledge that. Okay? What's really sad is it doesn't really help. Okay? To what end? 
To what end do you want people to know about your pain? Would it help to hear, have somebody know what you've been through? Because every time you've told somebody, how come you had to tell it again? If it helped, you wouldn't have had to tell it again. It didn't help. How many times have you told your story? Now, this has been fascinating to me to watch this over the years, have people come in and they will tell their story and they have rehearsed it. 20, 30, 40, 50 times they've told this story. And then they come in and they give it to me and I stop them in the middle and go, well, wait, wait, what about this? What about what? Don't stop me, I haven't finished my narrative. <laughs> Did it help to do it the 49 times before? Let's stop this thing and listen for a second. Where was Jesus in any of this? Uh, what? Jesus is redeeming this need. And this is the thing that has been fascinating to me that I've been learning lately, is that Jesus is redeeming this need to tell our story. I have found, I can tell him my story. Amen. This is kind of very interesting, because when I go to tell him my story, he laughs through most of it. Why? Because all he's seeing is his fingerprints. He's seeing how I've responded really silly. <laughs> and actually, a couple times he said, so have you learned? Yeah. Well, maybe, Lord, maybe you need to show me what I'm supposed to have learned, and I'll tell you if I learned it or not. <laughs> hmm. Why is the Lord laughing at my pain? He's not. He's laughing at my response to it. Okay? Why have you suffered, really? There's got to be a reason that we may know him in the midst of it all that we may know him right there in the middle of it, even in our past. And this has been fascinating for me because people say, well, I had all this stuff happen in my life, and then I got born again when I was 35. What about all this other stuff? <laughs> so here we are, and we say, well, Lord, would you take them back to when this certain thing when they gave themselves up to fear, would you take them back? They go back way before they got born again, and they gave themselves up to fear back then. And the Lord walks into their past and tells them stuff, and we get to bless them in their past. What do we get to do? We get to time travel in the soul, go back into the past, and watch it be redeemed. Come on, that's awesome! Amen. It just boggles my mind. And when I first figured out that we are actually doing soulish time travel, it kind of... I, yeah, fried a brain. I started tripping breakers. <laughs> huh? What? I, we can do that? Yeah, we can't go back physically and change the event, but we can go back soulishly and affect the pain. Get rid of the lie that was received and get that thing, and then the blessing that was not there at the time, I can insert now and find that the blessing I inserted in the past is affecting my present. God, this is awesome. This is double time stream stuff. This is changing. It's changing the effects of the response. Exactly. And it's, it's why, why are we feel like we're limited? But here's the problem. People say, well, don't get rid of my pain. I won't have a story to tell. Oh. Listen, that's so accurate. People saying, well, if I don't have all this to gain my sympathy, then who's going to have sympathy for me? Well, how is that working out for you before? How much sympathy have you gotten? Can you quantify that? Does it come in liters? <laughs> no, I have five cups of sympathy on my shelf. <laughs> I wouldn't know what that was like. I don't get a whole lot of sympathy. I wonder why not. All right, even in our past. Okay, which brings us to Revelations. What? What? Ah! What? Chapter 12. No. <laughs> Revelation chapter 12. I love this. And I am not going up in the first part of the chapter. I'm not doing all that other stuff. No, I'm going to start in verse 10. You guys are just... There should be a public flogging. Right? <laughs> okay. 
Verse 10, it says, And I heard a great voice saying in heaven, Now has come the salvation and power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, because the accuser of our brethren is cast down, the one accusing them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their souls even unto death. This is one of my very favorite passages because it says he over, they overcame him. Now, there is one person that needs to be overcome in everybody's life right here today. The right crowd came, and I'm not even going to ask you if the right crowd came. I'm going to tell you that the right crowd came. Anybody here ever be accused of anything? Anybody here ever be affected by the accuser of the brethren? Anybody here feel like you feel like I'm just a failure I'm not worth anything I'm not good enough I can't do it I'm not well trained any of those sentences that come to mind anywhere in the past that's all lies from the accuser of the brethren so the right crowd came it tells us in the scripture how to overcome him So that means if we're still listening to these voices, we aren't doing what the Scripture told us to do. When he gives us the tools and says, here, here's how you defeat him. And we sit there and go, okay, got him. And they just keep, okay, we'll use the tools. Go beat him up. Get rid of the accuser of the brethren. Yes. <laughs> Can I tell him that a little bit? We were going to the court of heaven with Carolyn, okay? And the accusers over there just screaming stuff. And we're standing before the throne of God. And she's standing, and this accuser's over there just screaming. And she just, she says, Lord, can we stop him? <laughs> so you tell it. Oh, he put his own hand over his own mouth. God says, can we shut him up? And all of a sudden, the accuser goes. <laughs> now, we're cracking up. We're, what? <laughs> we're having a very good time before the throne of God. As the accuser of the brethren has no voice left because his own hand is covering his own mouth. And he can't be heard. This was too cool. We're cracking up. Three weapons against the accuser that work. Traditionally, we've only used one. Traditionally, we've only used one. And I even did that this morning on purpose on what song we sang to gather everybody in here. Are you washed in the blood? <laughs> okay, why? Because traditionally, we go, yeah, blood of the lamb. Yeah, yeah, the blood of the lamb. We got that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, except the people that I knew that traditionally had that still didn't use it against the cues of the brethren. They didn't really understand what happened with the blood of the lamb. Wow, this is major. I have been redeemed. The blood, he bought me and he owns me. I am a blood-bought child of the king. I have been purchased by him. Really? We don't act like it. We keep acting like we own ourselves. We keep acting like we're the ones in charge. This is, this is crazy. We have been purchased by him, and yet he's the last one we consult about what to do. It's not just that he had purchased us. He entered into blood covenant with us. How much power and authority do we have? Oh, way more than we know. Way more than we know. Amazing. We are in blood covenant with Jesus. In Christ, we're in blood covenant with the Father. Who do we have blood covenant with? The Godhead. Are you kidding me? And we're still defeated? And in the middle of this, here I am, bought by... How do you know something is valuable? By how much somebody will pay for it. Okay, and we found this to be true around here as we've tried to sell different things. We've looked at things and said, this is valuable. This is going to bring us a lot of money. And people come, I'll give you 20 bucks for it. Really? <laughs> it's worth about 20 bucks. 
Why is it only worth 20 bucks? Because that's what anybody will pay for it. That's all that anybody will pay for it. If you can't get any more out of it than that, then what's it worth? 20 bucks. So if you're looking at an item and you're holding a diamond in your hand and it's worth $100,000 because somebody will pay $100,000 for it, is that a valuable diamond? Yes. It's more valuable than my car. Okay. Really? That's a lot of money. I mean, for those of you who $100,000 isn't very much, I'm, I'm sure I'm not, you know, anybody here like that? <laughs> <laughs> Except for the deceived ones, okay? <laughs> okay. No, that's a lot of money. Okay, that, why? Because somebody will pay for that. So this last week, somebody auctioned off the first issue of Spider-Man. A Spider-Man issue, and he got, it was a 9.4 rating on how good it is. It was a 9.4. He got $465,000 for a comic book okay the guy who sold one before him had a 9.7 rating which means it's almost mint yep. and he got 1.2 million for a comic book what's it worth it's worth what somebody will pay for it so you're looking at it go now Let's talk about you again. You're sitting there going, I'm not worthy. I'm not this. I'm not this. Shut up. Enough already. How valuable are you? God spent the blood of his son to gain you. How valuable are you? You are worth the blood of Jesus Christ. You are worth so much. You are actually invaluable. There is no way of placing value priceless and yet I keep hearing people go I'm just I'm just yes. uh, quit just stop <laughs> the bloodline of authority the bloodline of authority I have I have had demons talk back at me which not very often <laughs> not very often trust me on this not very often usually they just okay we're out okay I've had them talk back I'm going really you're talking back to me? I have the blood of Jesus Christ and you? Boy, just bring it up. They're gone. Eh, they don't even want to talk about it. You, you talked back to me? Almost makes me twitch. Just, are you, really? Oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to enjoy this. You talk back to me. They, they, oh, you shouldn't have done that. What do I do when they talk back? I take them straight to Jesus. Because I go to the Lord and say, Hey, Lord, you gave me authority over this guy, and he's talking back to me. What do you want to do with him? Well, they don't show up anymore after that. You want to mess with me? I've got the bloodline of authority. <laughs> the lamb who was slain, the blood of the lamb... He's on the throne, where? In the right of the Father. On the throne, in the right of the Father. You can't separate them, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You can't say, he does, Jesus doesn't have a separate throne. He doesn't have one, a throne on the, by the right of the Father. That's not what the words are in the Greek. It says Jesus is in the right of the Father. So when you look at the Father, Jesus is in his right. His Holy Spirit is in his left. I mean, they're, they're one. He's in the right of the Father. Wow. Do our lives show that we are blood-bought? And yet we're still trying to do our own career choices. Oh, did, did I meddle? Did I step out too far? <laughs> no. <laughs> we're still trying to do our own career choices. Wait a minute. Why don't you find out what God wants for you? Because you are now no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. You are his. What does he want to do with you? Well, the Lord says he wants me to go do this, but I don't think that's going to be much fun. You're saying no to the God of the universe. Think about it. Phew, amazing to me. Yeah, when you say no to the God of the universe, you've got a lot of things to overcome. <laughs> you don't need demons. You've got your flesh. <laughs> 
You know, it's just... <laughs> I've seen the enemy and it is us, right? That truth helps overcome the accuser. Okay, well, that's only the blood of the lamb. Are we using the blood of the lamb to get rid of the accuser of the brethren? Okay, well, how about the word of our testimony? This is kind of where I'm heading today. This is a big deal. Why? How do I overcome the accuser of the brethren by the word of my testimony? Well, if I can talk, if all I can talk about is my pain, what testimony? If all I can say is God wasn't there for me, he didn't do this, he didn't do that, what is your testimony? Your testimony is that God is useless. That's what you communicate. In fact, is in Acts 1.8, I might bring this up again next week, but in Acts 1.8, which I wasn't supposed to talk about because of the rule of Roxanne, says, <laughs> and we shall... <laughs> there it goes, right out the window. <laughs> and we shall be witnesses. witnesses yes. Okay? After that, the powers come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You know what he doesn't say in there? That is one of the biggest things, is finding out what God does not say. What he does not say, it says, you will be my good witnesses. He said, you're going to be my witnesses and ain't going to witness to me good, bad, indifferent. And you're going to tell people that God isn't worth anything. And you're going to tell people that God doesn't save, that God doesn't heal, that God doesn't deliver. That's what you're going to tell people. You're going to be my witnesses. Where is Jesus in all of this? Where is the testimony? When I focus on me, the accuser, therefore, has a foothold. When I'm focused all about me, what do I get? Okay? Well, but I was molested when I was young. Okay? Now, let's find Jesus in the middle of it so that can be a testimony, not a, an indictment against God. Okay? Do I feel bad that you were molested when you were young? Yes. It's horrible. Nothing I can say is going to make that better. But what Jesus says is going to make that better. What's going to happen? You're going to come away with a testimony of what Jesus has done. Okay, he continually beats me up over my failures. The accuser does. Continually beats me up over my failures. What have you done wrong? Well, name it. Okay. I was recounting one day how many churches and ministries I have seen fail under my hand. Okay? Say, really? Well, that's what the accuser said. They ended. They did end. But that doesn't make it a failure. I'm the one that put it in as a failure. And guess what the accuser of the brethren has? A hook right there. Look at that. Lee, you're just a failure in ministry. Okay, now that took a while. That took some ministry. My church failed in Golden. Did it? No. Vast victory. Lives were changed. We had to close down the church in Moscow. Failure? No. Lives were changed. We had to close down the Bible school. Failure? No. We worked ourselves out of a job. We taught the churches how to have their own Bible schools so they didn't need us anymore. And we didn't have any students. What do you call that? Empty Bible school, okay? Because they're out doing it already. Okay, <laughs> cut it down. So you just, wow. Failures? Not a one. But the accuser of the brethren tries to, to bring that up. Failure? Yeah. Did it work out the way man says success should be? Well, no. why am I listening to what man says success should be? Because <laughs> man is a total failure. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is the only success. Ah, oh, amazing to me. Jesus is bigger than any of my failures. Big time. He is good for redeeming all of my story. He is good for redeeming all of my story. All the things I've gone through, all the things, whatever. Jesus is good for redeeming it. I look back, and now I see, I, after reading my account of what happened in Bukavu, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I went, hmm, I wonder how many of my other stories are twisted. <laughs> all of them. That's all right. Kind of interesting. 
He is good for redeeming all of my story. He takes away all of the pain. My story becomes his story, which is true history. What is history? His story. Amen. Okay, that's the way it should be. What can the accuser do to me now? <laughs> nothing. If, if there is nothing but seeing what Jesus has done in me and seeing his victory in all these things, what does the accuser have to say? Amen. You're bad. No, wait a minute. That was covered under the blood. Let's go back another slide. His blood cleansed me. Okay, what, what? I am cleansed. Did I do that sin? Yeah. It's not accredited to me anymore. It has been washed away. Not just covered, washed away. How fun. Did I do it? Yes. Is that me? No. <laughs> I love it. Oh, not loving my soul even unto death. The third weapon. Oh, this is just light and fluffy. Right? When my focus is on me, I don't lay down my soul. <laughs> when, my, when I focus on me, I actually promote it and I lift up my soul. What about me? Pump that soul up there. Get that buddy up there where he's my phileo to my soul. Yes, he's just a wonderful guy. Isn't he wonderful? It matters, when it matters what I think, what I want, and what I feel, I'm in the wrong focus. When my soul is not being laid down, my worship, therefore, is on me and my pain. Now, doesn't that feel good? Doesn't that just feel real good to hear all that, that that's self-worship? <laughs> and here we are search me oh God and know my heart try me and know my thoughts see if there be any idolatrous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting what's he saying let's find out what in you are you worshiping about yourself if I won't forgive I'm worshiping me if I don't forgive, I'm worshiping me. I have to get my soul dealt with to lay it down. Really, I have to do some stuff, and then I can lay it down. I must get my past dealt with so that I can love his way. So I can see somebody through his eyes. I got to lay down what I think and pick up what he thinks. I got to lay down what I want and pick up what he wants. I got to lay down what I feel and pick up what he feels for somebody. And there where I can even love an enemy that very way. That's the only way I can truly forgive. It's the only way to see people through God's eyes. Truly loving is pure maturity. Growing up into the full stature of the fullness of Christ. Growing up in love to the full stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians chapter 3. I can't do that when I'm focused on my own pain. So this is kind of a fascinating. If I'm focused on me, the accuser of the brethren wins. If I'm not focused on me, when I get my stuff dealt with, I can actually use the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony and, the, and not lay down my soul. And the accuser of the brethren has no hold on. He's thrown down. That right there should tell us everything. That should be absolute beauty. When the, ans when the accuser has no voice in my life, well, then I'm pretty powerful. That's pretty slick. I must change to become who I really am because I haven't found out who I really am yet. I'm in the process of changing. There must be no anger to protect myself anymore. No anger to protect myself. I've got to not protect myself. I have to have no fear to, that would drive me down, drive me under. Fear drives you under, scares you, puts you down. Oh, no fear, not when it's in him. Able to perceive the big picture with me in it. Wait a minute, what's the big picture? God is doing something mighty on this planet. He wants to do something. He's getting ready. There's going to be something big showing up here not too far, far down our road. And what's going to happen? Well, wait a minute. I want to be in that picture. Huh? I want to be a part. 
What's going to happen? What, what is God going to use me for next week? I don't know. It's going to be good. What's he going to use you for in a month? Huh? It's awesome. Who are you? Can you see yourself in the big picture? Because if you keep downplaying yourself, downplaying what God's going to do through you, you can't see yourself in the big picture. You feel like you've been left out, passed over. You're nothing. You're insignificant. No, you're not. When you start getting rid of the accuser of the brethren, you can see yourself in that big picture and who God is going to use you to be. Wow. Really big. Nothing to do with pride. I see me in the big picture. That's nothing to do with pride. That's true humility, submitting myself under the hand that God has. It's not about personal pride. It's about being humbled, being put down into the place where I can be used of God and knowing that I am firm in that and no accusation. I love that aspect. The truth sets me free. Amen. So what is the truth? What is the truth, actually? Well, I'm dead to self and alive to God in Jesus my Lord. That's the truth. That's the absolute truth. You say, but I don't see it. Then you're seeing what? Deception. The absolute truth is what the scripture says. Right? Therefore, <laughs> make an examination of it. That's my testimony and it sets me free. That is my testimony. That's the word of my testimony. Is who God has made me be. I'm dead to self and alive to God. Now, I'm going to do this part really quickly because I, we don't need to dwell on it very strong. I just, I'm just trying to, to show you something that is fascinating. Here's Saul of Tarsus. Okay? He's out persecuting the, the church, the way. And he's out there dragging people into prison, beating them, flogging them, doing stuff, even to the point of, of death, killing some Okay, we find him at, when Stephen is being stoned. He's approving of it, and he's taking care of everybody's jackets so they can stone him to death. Okay, he's got all their garments. He's going to take care of it. We see him. This is Saul of Tarsus. So vindictive in the things of Judaism. He is just militant nasty about the things of God in his eyes. <laughs> he has letters from the Jerusalem council and he's going up into Damascus to go and search out the people of the way and he's going to drag them back in prison have them beaten everything everything's going to fall apart he's up there to destroy and on the process God shows up with his little beam of light Somebody's Bing! he falls down his eyes go completely blind and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus, the one you persecute. That's the only thing he sees is Jesus. Everything else is total blind. Die, yeah, hi. He says, it's kind of hard for you to kick against the goads, isn't it? God, kind of tricky. He says, now rise up and go. And I'm going to have somebody take care of you in Damascus. So, uh, and they pick him up, and he's blind. They have to lead him into the city. He goes in there, and God talks to a certain man named Ananias. And he says, Ananias, I'm sending you over to this guy named Saul. And guy, hey, uh, Lord, isn't this the guy that's killing all the Christians? Hello? You know? Hello? Are you sure? He says, yeah, that's the same one. Watch what the Lord told him about Saul. This is fascinating. He says, And the Lord said to him, Go, for this one is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before nations and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer of my name. Now, how did he get Ananias to go? He says, I'm going to make him suffer. <laughs> okay, I'm going. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to, don't worry, he's going to suffer about all this. This is hilarious to me. I think this is really good. Talking to Ananias about Paul, we know nothing of Paul's suffering before Christ. Now, this is fascinating to me. We know nothing of his life before. He never talked about any of it. Why? It's fascinating because his life ended right here. We know a good deal about his life after this conversion time. Great deal about it, but nothing about that before. Isn't that remarkable? Does that not amaze you? Okay. 
Now, what was Paul's take on it? So, later, he's talking to the governors and the different things, and he's talking about all this. Thing. Here's Paul's take on it. This is what he says that Ananias told him. You follow what I'm saying? This is Paul's take of what Ananias told him. And, and Ananias said, and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, and to see the just one, and to hear a voice out of his mouth. For you shall be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now what do you intend? Now this is what Ananias actually said to Paul. He says, Now rising up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Deal with your sins. Now this is... A, People use this saying, see, it proves that baptism is, has to be involved in salvation. That's not what it says. It says, be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Okay, how does he get rid of his sins? He calls on the name of the Lord. But what does he have to do? It's not private. This is what makes this fun, is that he asked him to make it public. He says, now be baptized. What? I want everybody in the world to see that Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, is now a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins are washed away, now be baptized and show it as a mark to everybody. That's fun. Your life is now over and everything's just beginning. And in Paul, this is absolutely true, his life was done in his past. He's now a point of demarcation saying this is the beginning and this is all there is to it. Hang on. Now I like this part. It's like, okay, here's what the Lord is going to do now. I want you to just hang on. Because from now on, it's going to be a ride. Second Corinthians, and I'm going to read all this rather quickly. This is Paul writing, okay? And he says, are they Hebrews? I also. Are they Israelites? I also. Are they Abraham's seed? I also. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as beside myself. I am, I'm talking crazy stuff here. He, and he's just, just ranting. He says, I being beyond them in labors more abundantly, in stripes beyond measure, in prisons much more, in deaths many more. Five times I received 40 stripes minus one from the Jews. I was flogged three times. I stoned once. <laughs> and he ain't talking marijuana here. Okay? I was stoned once. <laughs> Paul is starting to tell of what has happened since his conversion. This is only after he became a Christian. Life was boring before Christ, and yet he was so strong in what he was doing, he was the head of the persecution. The head of Judaism for persecution. Amazing. And it goes on and says, I was shipwrecked three, shipwrecked three times. I spent a night and a day in the deep. I've been in travels often, in dangers of rivers, in dangers of robbers, in dangers from my race, in dangers from the nations, in dangers of the city, in dangers in the wilderness, in dangers in the sea, in dangers among false brethren, in hardship and toil, often in watchings and hunger and thirst, often in fastings, in cold and nakedness. If this is supposed to be a brochure to become a Christian, this is not working real well. And it goes on and says, And besides the things outside conspiring against me day by day, I have the care of all the assemblies. Not only do I have all the stuff from the outside, but I have all the Christians against me too. I got to take care of them all. He says, Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is caused to stumble and, I, and do I not burn? If it is right to boast, I will boast of the things of my infirmity. Okay. Well, that was quick. All of this was because Christ was in his life. And we keep telling people, oh, just try Jesus. He'll make your life better. They would not have won that with Paul. He would not. Life is going to make your life better. Actually, yes. Easier? Not so much. Okay, what did he have? He had Christ in his life and went through all of this. Folks, what are we signed up for? What is our Christianity? We're signed up to suffer. We're signed up to go through whatever the Lord has for us and respond right. We're signed up to do whatever God has for us. What is the message that God has for this church? You're going to go through the stuff. How are you going to respond? I think it's fascinating. He considered this as normal. <laughs> the normal Christian walk. Let's go out and get flogged. It goes on for another couple chapters, by the way. It goes on and on and on. 
to the end of the book. What was the outcome? It's all worth it to know Jesus Christ. It's all worth it to know Jesus Christ. I'll do it all again. Amazing. Now, this is where I've been, I really wanted to come. This is, this is fun. This is really good. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I love this passage. I love teaching this thing. I love looking at it again. This thing is so fun for me because it should be our normality. Watch this. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld, and what our hands touched as regarding the word of life. And the life was revealed or manifested, and we've seen, and we bear witness, and we announce to you the everlasting life which was with the Father and was revealed to us. We announce to you what we have seen, what we have heard, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to you that your joy may be full. What? What we've seen. What we've beheld. That's, that's two different things. What we've observed and what we've scrutinized. And what our hands have touched, manipulated, and worked concerning the word of life. Wow, this is powerful. What have you seen? Now, this is scary. Because are we seeing miracles every single day? Actually, yes. Are we seeing limbs being grown out and wheelchairs thrown away? Different parts of the world, different times. Yeah, still are. Are we seeing miracles? Yeah. On a regular basis, what have you seen? What have you touched? See, it's not enough to have seen a miracle. Trust me on this one. I saw a miracle. I saw a recreative miracle 18 inches in front of my nose. I saw God recreate an arthritic elbow, take all the arthritis away, and recreate a brand new elbow in a lady's arm right in front of my face. I could hear it snap, pop, and creak. Grind. It was weirding me out. I'm watching this. I didn't believe God did this in our time. You understand? God was messing with me. Oh, he does that very well. We're all, everybody's going, oh, poorly, God's messing with you. Yeah. I'm sitting here watching this, hearing this, and she couldn't bend her arm. She couldn't even bend it when she first started. And then pretty soon she's reaching up with that arm and wiping tears out of her eyes like this with an arm she hasn't been able to bend in years You'd think just even muscle memory she'd done it with the other arm. God just started working. And she's in an ecstasy. She doesn't even know what's going on. She's just completely oblivious to it. We're all sitting there going, ah, freaking. No, yeah, I don't know if anybody else is. I am totally wigging out. It's not enough. It's, it is enough to have it done under your own hand. You see, so many people have a, a witness saying they've seen it happen, but it's not enough. What have you touched? What our hands have manipulated? We ought to be the people who are the ones who are bold enough to go out and lay hands on the people until we're seeing it, we're not just seeing it, but feeling it. We're actually having it move. Okay? First, I mean, when first, time, first guy we prayed for died. Took care of that. Okay? Uh, we tried everything. He just, hey, what the fuck? He died. Have we seen people healed? Oh, yeah. Well, it just, it's one thing to see it from somebody else, but to do it under your own hand makes you know that God is working. When you see it from somebody else, does it, that's when you say, wow, they're a mighty man of God. That's one of the worst things that can happen is somebody tithe or they, they give a gift and they get back a hundredfold return and the check comes in the mail. One of the worst things that could possibly happen. Because everybody else in the church falls apart because they did it and they didn't get a hundredfold return. And then their faith just boom, dies. It's not enough to see it. You have to experience it. You have to put your own hands on it. 
You guys have had this experience. You've had healings happen underneath your hands, haven't you? Yeah, it's pretty exciting, huh? Yeah. What have you touched? What has God done through you? There's something about leading somebody to Jesus, being the one who leads them to Jesus is, is really amazing. It's not enough to hear that nine people were born again during Sunday school. That's awesome. But how about the person you led to Jesus today? What would that do to your faith? Yes. See, it really is not enough to hear about it. You've got to get your hands dirty. You've got to get it in there. All of this constitutes your testimony. What are you talking? You're talking about the testimony of somebody else doing the healing. What about you doing the healing? What's your testimony? Okay, to go through your life and know, uh, you know, I've, like I said, I've known many of you in the things that, have got, that has happened in your life and you're coming up with a testimony of what God did in your life and how he's redeemed it. Now he's made you who you are today. How he's changed things. How he's taken away the pain. Now this is what? Your testimony. It isn't about somebody else's. It's about yours. Not what you, it's not what you have been through. It's what has been done through you. Okay? What are you using? What is your testimony? What is God saying to you? You lay hands on people. You watch the healings. What have you lived that shows Christ on this planet? What have you lived that shows what Christ is on the planet? See, I'm trying to get the idea. That here's the deal. The accuser of the brethren is trying to use you or damage you. And what? By the word of your testimony. But what happens if you don't have a testimony? What if you don't have something that shows? Well, how do you know that Christ is alive in you? How do you know that he is here on the planet? How do you know that he answers prayer? How do you know that he heals? What is your testimony? When the accuser of the brethren comes up and says, you're just not very much. Well, wait a minute. This hand is a hand that God can work through, and I can lay it on people, and healing can happen. How cool is that? I can lay it on people and watch them being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, that little hand with the little spots and everything. It's cool. Okay. What has Jesus Christ helped you through? What has he done? That is what you have to brag about. Not because you did it, but because he did it through you. What do you have to brag about? That I am here and God is functional. And look at this. It's too cool. It's not your pain, but his grace through the pain that is valuable. How are you responding to what is happening? Most of our suffering has been because of our own flesh. <clears throat> no, no. We don't need to suffer for that. Did Jesus get any glory out of what's happening? Did Jesus get the glory for this? Where is Jesus in the middle? Did you find him in the midst of all this sort of stuff? Are you finding out who is being worshipped? Are these challenging questions? These are good questions. I want us to be pushed by these. Are people looking forward to what you have to tell them about? Most of the time, people don't want to hear anything you have to say because you're going to go right back to your, hey, this is bad, and this is bad. Nyah, 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 nyah. I had this happen, and this happened. And this. Okay. Do people avoid listening to your story? They don't when it has Jesus in it. Okay, it's different. Now, you, you might get persecuted because of it, but at least you're going to have something that the story has but power your, behind it. Your story should have hope. Your story should have hope. So is your story about you or is your story about him? No, uh -huh. uh, yeah. God's grace is sufficient for you. Let it be. Find him in the middle of all of it. So, Lord, this is the question. How do you want me to respond? I'm going through this. How do you want me to respond? How can I apply what you have to this situation and watch your glory happen? Is that a good question? I think that's an awesome question. It's a tough question. So, the way is before you. Hmm. What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with him? What is your story telling other people? 
What is your story telling other people? Be the testimony. Be the testimony. We will revisit this idea some next week. But there's some things that we gotta, what are we, what are we talking about? Who are you? The glory of the Lord. Gee, what's, what's the mystery of the ages? See, I should make you quote that a little bit different. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I want you to just not, this is not Christ in you, and you kind of that generic you out there thing, but Christ in me. The mystery of the ages is that Christ is living in me. Wow, how cool. Who are you more than you know? Who are you more valuable than you've let on? Even though your focus has been on you, it's been what? the wrong focus. Be on him and find your true value. Hmm. Interesting concept. Is this making us think? That's the idea. That's what we're looking for. Well, anyway, you are a testimony. You are a story. You are a promise. You are a possibility. You are a promise with the capital P. <laughs> 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 let's pray Father God I thank you you are a mighty and an awesome God and we love you so dearly thank you for what you've done for us to us, through us, in us, around us, to us everything Lord we are entangled in who you are and you are actively working in our lives and Lord I just pray that this week there would be miracle after miracle after miracle under the hands of the people in this room as they step out, step off the cliff and give it a shot. And Lord, I thank you that we are working on having a testimony being built in us. And we give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You are blessed. Go with God. <laughs>